Eka Ikbert, welcome to How the Light Gets In. Thank you, thanks for having me. Could you tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, your work with developmental economics in Africa? Um, yes, of course. So, um, yes, you've said my name, I'm Eka. Um, I am the director of the African Leadership Centre at King's College London. Um, right now, uh, myself a student of development economics, uh, but from a very heterodox perspective, so uh, a critical scholar is how I like to frame myself. Um, and, you know, if I take that as a, as a um, you know, departure for sort of thinking about my work, it's really about um, thinking about how economics is influenced by other disciplines and influences other disciplines because of the dynamic character of reality, uh, really. But also questioning um, sort of the frameworks that have been given to us that don't quite deliver what they've promised on the subject of development, this contentious subject of development. So given your critical stance to some of these frameworks, can you say a little bit about what you think the main weaknesses of the ways through which we approach development these days are? Um, so a, a key one, which, you know, the you know, whole group of people that uh, have this stance as well, um, is the sort of uh, the, the market fundamentalist approach that really insists on how um, you know, the markets uh, are more the most significant element of uh, development processes and outcomes and fails to um, engage with the reality that actually markets alongside a host of other entities, including states, including societies, are very closely interlinked um, and interdependent. Uh, in so we tend to think of markets as having a separate life of their own. They, they exist in this kind of vacuum almost, but in reality, they are supported by a whole other network of things, including, as you said, states and state infrastructure mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. Does that have an implication of how we think of economics more generally, apart from developmental economics? I think absolutely, because a lot of the, the points and the arguments that we debate and reflect on within development economics are those of us working especially on uh, parts of the Global South in Asia and Africa, apply in other parts of the world. And I think, um, for instance, if we bring it to where we are in the UK and think of this very re this current uh, COVID period, how the state has had to step in to think about, well, it's always been there, but we've, we just see it more clearly, stepping in to address a lot of the challenges that have been wrought by the pandemic. We think of the significance of industrial development, manufacturing, when supply chains were failing, especially in, at the beginning of the pandemic. We see how a state, you know, uh, uh, cons led by a conservative government, um, is really uh, pushing in terms of the sort of finance and funding that's coming from that realm to address, uh, you know, the, this, this reality. And I think the UK is not alone in that. Where can we, can we draw a line between a kind of sort of neo-colonialist foreign interference and foreign aid, especially given the fraught history of the UK as a sort of empire and the relationship it's had with many of the countries that it directs foreign aid to today? Is there a clear-cut distinction there? How do we think of that? I think that's, <laughs> that's uh, you know, a very good question, along with the others you've asked. Um, it is very complex and complicated, but we, we do have to begin to make sense of how we unpack that. Um, because the reality is that we, these, those interlinkages exist. Yes, a lot of them, if I think of you know, parts of the continent of Africa that I study, a lot of them are rooted in you know, uh, really horrific colonial experiences, but they continue to exist. Um, but what I think is most significant is the agency of those in the former colonized world. The agency they have in how those resources are utilized. So this foreign investment, what purpose does it serve? Who decides the purpose that it should serve? Um, and also making sure, of course, the benefits um, accrue to wider parts of, uh, of society as well. Yeah, so that's a worry with development, uh, always whether the money actually goes into helping local communities or whether these are always opportunities for big businesses to come in and make a quick profit from a new country, a new market. Again, what are the what are the sort of safeguards that we can put in place to to prevent that from happening? Um, so I think certainly thinking more long term as opposed to short term. Uh, you know, I'm someone who really believes, and I you know not everyone will agree with me on this, who really believes um, in the significance of manufacturing and industrial development. But this is a long term endeavor. It's not going to yield quick, you know, quick. 
uh, outcomes. You know, it's it's about process. It's about putting this sort of infrastructure in place that will enable that. It's also about thinking of you know large scale infrastructure, thinking about uh, industrialization on a large scale, but also on a small scale as well. Um, and, and I think from there, that's why we're thinking about, you know, the kind of jobs being created from that, how lasting they're going to be. What, what you know, those sort of processes also mean for relationships between workers and employers as well. So we have to be thinking of productive work. You know, we know a lot about the working poor. So these cannot be processes that sort of expand that uh, part of, of society. When it comes to development, a critique that is often aired is this kind of like one size fits all approach. Is there a way of doing this differently or are we just sort of fated to just think of certain models and then just try and apply them to other places? Again, I think, you know, a very, very important point. Uh, Post-development theories are, you know, hot on this and often make the point that, you know, development really is imperialism by another name. And I think, you know, I would say you can see where they're coming from on that. The idea that a perfect model exists that everyone is working towards. Um, is of course problematic. There is the complexity though, the fact that the, the global economy is structured in a particular way and participation in that requires certain things of all those operating within that global economy. Nonetheless, I think there must be space for new ways of doing certain th things, new ways of thinking. The hierarchies in knowledge and who knows and who presents these models and who says what progress looks like. We have to be open to thinking again about what progress, look like, what progress looks like and what progress might be. And understanding of that can be dynamic and can change over time and will not be one size fits all. It will look different for certain parts of the same country. You know, I say all of that, recognizing, of course, it's very complicated to plan also on that basis, on the basis of, you know, difference in all of these uh, various spaces. You know, I don't have easy answers to that, but I think some humility uh, from a lot of us that, you know, uh, put ourselves forward as experts becomes very significant and very important. And a willingness to say, okay, we're trying this, it's not working, we need to step back. And rather than blame those communities, recognize the flaws in some of our thinking. We have to learn uh, as we go on some of these issues. Is that where some of the interdisciplinary kind of thinking that you mentioned in the beginning comes in, using knowledge from anthropologists, ethnologists, historians, and not just have economists that maybe don't have a very good understanding of, you know, a particular local history or the, the customs of a particular part of a country. Is that where that can help uh, inform the policy that economists then design? Absolutely. Absolutely. That interdisciplinarity, that recognition of the dynamic character of reality is, has to be central within that. And I think in addition to that, we have to think again of what knowledge looks like. It's not just those of us in universities in the UK or in Europe, in the US, or on the continent itself, in Nigeria, in Kenya, in South Africa. It's people outside of the academy as well, people living in those spaces. Um, it's oral histories uh, as well. And rather than uh, demean those by suggesting that because they're not in books, it's not proper knowledge, we have to retrain ourselves to, re to, you know, to think again of how we engage with that material, retrain ourselves to engage with that material and understand that material as well. You recently published a paper uh, on African fashion futures where you wrote on creative economies in relation to local development. Tell us a little bit about that work. No, of course. Uh, it, so that was an exciting, uh, um, it's part of an exciting project um, that I'm carrying out with colleagues uh, at King's uh, as well. Um, so there's more to come on that. Um, but this particular piece was um, an exploratory piece where we're asking questions um, around um, the conversations that I had about global value chains and especially the positioning of African firms within that. Quite often when we are, you know, the, on the subject of global value chains, the narrative is how African firms fit into the lower ends of the value chain. And our research engaging with fashion designers in two very important fashion cities um, in the world, I would argue, in Lagos and in Nairobi, um, showed immense um, innovation, originality. Um, that is lost if we think of firms in, on the continent as only um, carrying out activities such as cutting and making and sewing or pattern making, um, as opposed to sort of design, right? Those higher value activities. And so we are arguing that even that, that GVC framing, we have to think again of the place of firms in the global south. We have to think of them as potentially lead firms, or at least begin to open the space for a conversation that can locate them and recognize them as lead firms. You also work on post-conflict reconstruction, uh, the economic costs of conflict, 
Afghanistan has been in the news recently and the attempts at nation building there and the enormous cost of the war and everything that followed. Are there lessons to be learned from something that extreme in other contexts? Mm. So, you know, I think, you know, this is a, a, a lot of what has come out, you know, sort of commentary around this has pointed to the, some of the challenges with a sort of stabilization approach when we're thinking of engagement with uh, contexts that are affected by conflict. The idea that what we want to do is stem the tide and uh, just keep things stable and, and calm, um, regardless of the implications of that on uh, contexts and, and communities within that space. What voice there is um, in, within those spaces in terms of the kind of policy that's driven um, at higher levels as well is very critical, uh, I think, around that. And if I speak, you know, uh, spaces I'm more familiar with, uh, thinking of uh, context in uh, northeastern Nigeria, uh, you know, I think, uh, for instance, the, the approach to that conflict that has really been about um, you know, this is this is terrorism and we have to just uh, throw everything at it uh, to stem that as opposed to thinking, what are the dynamics that have underpinned this? Um, how can we engage that? And it is also a long term endeavor. There are no easy responses to this. These very harsh military responses you see in Afghanistan, how long that's gone on for. And in the end, it's not sufficient because it's never sufficient. One has to work and think with those in that space. And again, humility. Humility, recognizing when we don't fully understand or fully know um, and getting on board those who know better than us. But we have to admit that we don't fully know to be able to do that. Yeah, I think especially in the case of Afghanistan, it was again proof of the lack of local knowledge and the, the very short patience. 20 years was deemed a forever war, but of course 20 years to build a nation <laughs> might not be enough. How has your work impacted you on a more personal level and maybe also your politics? Does your work inform your politics? Does your politics inform your work? No, I think absolutely. I mean, it, it has, um, it has, you know, <laughs> it's a very good question, actually. I mean, personally, I, I, I've come from a place um, where I'm, you know, I'm Nigerian. I, I grew up in Nigeria, I was born in Lagos. And, you know, coming out to the UK to study, thinking of how parts of the world that I'm familiar with are presented, were not always recognizable in the classroom. Um, the sort of terms, epithets used to describe these spaces were not familiar uh, to me in many, many cases. Sort of blanket description of, uh, you know, these spaces is, you know, uh, this is a poor country, there's always conflict here. I recognize those spaces are far more complex than what was presented. And so it's been very important to my, in my work to be complex. It's not been easy. And I, you know, quite often, you know, carrying out research, writing a paper, banging my head against the wall because the line is not, it's not a straight line to my response or to my result. But that process is so enriching because um, it's forced me to also accept and to understand it is complex and that in itself is the result. It is complex and walking with that, grasping that, what can we engage in that complexity? What do we have to park in that complexity and come back to? And as academics, I mean, it's a lifetime of work uh, to do around that. But obviously your work also is very close to public policy and it forms public policy. Politics ultimately is about action. Can we incorporate some of that nuance and ambivalence in how we actually go on to act in the world and practice in the world or do we ultimately have to come down on one side or the other when it comes to that? I think we can absolutely include that uh, ambivalence and that uncertainty in how we carry out the work we do. I mean a lot of my work, a very uh, um, important part of my work that I enjoy immensely is teaching and this is a very important space for engaging I mean, students, you know, very, very bright students that come to us at the African Leadership Center. We have two master's programs in leadership and development and security, oh, sorry, on global leadership and peace building. Um, and, you know, teaching them in class that there aren't certainties, you know, we provide them with the vast array of scholarship that there is, the, the tools for complex thinking around the things they're going to do, but also this sense of humility. You guys are going to, we say to them, you're going to go on to lead all kinds of processes, but you must travel with a sense of, I always have something to learn, and I have something to learn in these spaces that I'm going to. You know, who I learn from may not be what I had in my mind. So this is a very important space, I think, for that, that training um, is a very impo important space um, for that work. But I think certainly as academics, you know, we contribute to the work. I mean, I've been engaged in 
conversations about UK Africa uh, trade engagement and the sort of post Brexit era. You know, whoever who's listening, I don't know, but at least that work has to be out there and they have to be in those spaces to have those conversations as well. Okay, but thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. For more debates, talks, and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.